how long does a cute black kid stay cute before mm. his age means that now he's looked at systematically as a threat. You know, I think by the time I was 16, I was earning like a thousand pound a week. So and what's that from? Just moving bits? A group of people came from the Caribbean who were 100% professionals mm -hmm. without one criminal record. So how does a group of people come here, all qualified, all mm -hmm. professionals, then birth a generation of criminals? How mm -hmm. does that happen? Hey guys, Charlie here, LITC Podcast, LITC Media. We've got another podcast coming up. What I need from you guys, I really need from you guys, is to like, subscribe. Like, subscribe. I think there should be some sort of thing coming up here for telling you to like and subscribe. But if you can do that, it'll really help us grow our following along our journey. Here we have Musa. Something like Wa alaikum salam. So I'm here. It's LITC podcast episode eight. And I don't know if you know much about what we do with our podcast, but the way we like to start is by looking at a bit of art and just basically get your opinion on it and what you think. Um, this one. Am I ever seeing... Am I ever seeing, like, two personalities stuck in one body? So having a quick look at it, I would say split personality. Split personality. That's what I get from it. You know what? I always say this. It's so subjective because various different people have looked at it and they, everyone's come up with something different, but I've never mm. thought about the split personality. But, yeah, mm. that's interesting. So, all right, cool. So, um, yeah, so this whole podcast is about people that are doing mm -hmm. stuff for the community, that work within the community and whatnot. And obviously you're doing a lot of amazing work that we're going to go into. I want to know a little bit about you and your journey. So, like, going back to the beginning, where you grew up, how you grew up, siblings, family life, all of that. I'll say growing up in the 90s, um, grew up in the 90s, South London, Wharf Road, um, brothers and sisters, Came from a strong family unit. Um, growing up on Wharf Road, um, it was very different than it is now. Um, it was very, I would say, white on Wharf Road back in the days. It's mm -hmm. definitely changed now with different ethnicities being all around Wharf Road. But um, it was very different at the time mm -hmm. when I grew up. And I'm saying it was a different era. There were different challenges that we faced that, that we face today as a community. Grew up in a two-parent household. Father passed away when I was quite young. That changed the dynamics of the household. I think that changed my um, journey and um, being the oldest child yeah. to my siblings. I felt like there was more, more um, pressure on me as an older sibling. The fact that dad weren't around, I became a protector for my siblings. Did yeah. you feel, so cut you, do you feel like, so you took on, do you feel like you was more responsible? You had an extra responsibility? Yeah, but mum was great. My uncles were great. Family members were great. I was never in a space where we didn't have that family support. You know, a lot of my uncles took up that father figure role. You mm -hmm. know, African family. Um, they came here. My mum came to the UK when she was, you know, in her, I would say in her mid-20s, early 20s. And yeah. um, But I think someone like myself being raised here, I, I understood the, the dynamics of the streets much different than they did. So what, you know, when you say that, what was that like? So when you say like, because I grew up in Moore Road up until about 11, about, yeah, about 11. Mm. But you know, like, like you said, coming from an African family and then obviously you said from a, you lost your dad at a young age. Mm. What was that like being an African kid in Moore Road back then growing up? You said it was that great growing up. What was it like? Yeah, it was different. I think there was a lot of African families. There was a lot of yeah. West African families. There was Nigerians. There was Sierra Leoneans. There was um, Ghanaians. So I was one of the only East Africans that I knew. So I was learning a lot of West African culture growing up. But at the same time, then there was also predominantly a white area. So we had a lot of, you know, English kids. Um, um, it was a, a racist time or a race fueled uh, environment. It wasn't as people wasn't as educated as they are today and mm. um, but at the same time i wouldn't say that it was an overly racist environment where man didn't have fun a man yeah. didn't grow up it's just that um racial slurs were out there more than they are today like you know what i mean standard for the geese yeah. yeah them colored boys yeah, are over yeah, there yeah, like all yeah, of that yeah, sort of yeah yeah 100 yeah, yeah. so you'd hear more racial slurs cars driving by yeah. You know, as you wouldn't hear that today like in, it, no one ain't throwing them type of things out their window anymore 
to that extent unless some type of events taking place. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. But you'd hear that. But um, at the same time, no, we cracked on, we made things happen. Um, and yeah, it was just, I feel like, especially my mother, having to raise kids on her own. And um, she'd done well. Uh, her siblings helped her. My uncles, they done well. And um, was a good family unit. But yet again, because I understood some of the things that were, take, that were happening on the streets, um, I knew I had to protect myself because I wasn't on that. And also, they grew up with a lot of Caribbean kids, mm. a lot of, um, like I said, English kids who, when things kicked off, certain men would draw for their dad. I'm going to get my dad. Yeah, you know yeah, what I'm saying? Yeah. And certain dads were just young. Looking back now, man thought they were old, innit? But he's most probably like, what, 25? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's got a son. He had his, I don't know, he had his son when he was, who knows, like 15. Yeah, yeah, Son's 10, was. my yeah, age. Yeah, yeah. Man's turned up 25. Like, who, who's troubled my yeah, son? Yeah, he's on crowd, innit? Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm trying to say? Then man's thinking he's a big man, but yeah, you them dads that will turn up wanting to fight you or make you fight his son. And if you yeah. beat up his son, he'll get involved. Yeah. You know, that stuff used to happen a lot. And not having that, had to mean to, means that I had to adapt and be on another level of, of, um, of fighting or of or my aggression had to be totally on a different level. So I think I adapted, and I created a persona or a new life or a new image of myself that meant that when people saw my brothers, they would be like, "Oh, that's my man's brother." Yeah. And then they didn't have to go down that path. And I say a lot. And one of my brothers, a journalist, the other one's a scriptwriter. They they do amazing things in their professions now. Mm. But even though we grew up in the same household, we had totally different, different paths. Yeah, yeah. But people used to see them and be like, oh, "You're my man's brother," and that was it. They just be able to cut through. And how? And sorry, we, how, your siblings. What's like the age differences? So, um, my brother's like there was like between my other brother, there's like a three year difference, four year, mm. and then. The, the youngest one, there's like a um, 10 year difference. Yeah. So then obviously you're saying like you had that responsibility and you felt like you had to be the man of the house because you was obviously the oldest and it probably affected you in a, it yeah, affects 100%, everyone, but it affects you in a 100%, different way. I was, I was more, uh, I, I, I was able to understand, not even, even if I wasn't, I was able to digest, yeah. even if I wasn't fully able to take in what had happened, but I knew that that, that, that died in it. Mm-hmm. And knowing that, I was able to understand he's not coming back. Whereas I think my other brother, who would have been about six, might not have understood it to that level. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm trying to say? So then I was able to understand, okay, this was going on. No more parents evening with dad. Mm-hmm. No more, you know, birthdays or anything like that. I was able to understand that and see how that looked like. But I wasn't able to take in the impact it had on mum, the impact it had on the family. But um, yeah, that that just brought me into a certain environment where a lot of the men that I was mm-hmm. growing up, who, their dads weren't around. It was for other reasons. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't because my dad was an accountant. He had a good job. We had a good life because of that. My mom was a, a housewife. Um, she done great raising the kids, but her her profession was um was in education. But mm. with dad being an accountant, doing good stuff in his field, she was a housewife handling the stuff. She reverted back to that once he passed away. But a lot of my brethren that I grew up with, their dads weren't about because they just weren't about. Yeah. You know I mean, it's not that they passed away. They yeah. were just out there, yeah. some in prison, some on the roads. Some just weren't t- the type of men that were in their children's lives. So my brethren, growing up with them, not them not seeing their dad kind of made us feel like we were the same, but we wasn't. You know what I mean? Mm. It was totally too different because man's dad's around somewhere. He just, certain times we'll see my, uh, one of my brethren's dads and he walk past him. So, you know, that was my dad, you know, yes, you know what I'm yeah, saying? But he's yeah. not on anything. We get it now because we're grown yeah. and we're men and we understand those type of individuals now. But, yeah, that was an environment then still. Yeah. And then, so, all right, so you're going on to school and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Carry on through that. Yeah, so the secondary school, I went to school in Peckham. From Warford, I went to St. Thomas the Apostle. I went to school in Peckham. And that brought me into a new space. Growing up on Wolf Road, I got, you meet a lot of new different people, right? Yeah, yeah. So going into Peckham, I got introduced to... Um, a lot of kids from Peckham, a lot of demanding from Peckham, um, and then your level of, um, I wouldn't say there was criminality at an early age. When I was in year six, year seven, I wasn't on no no badness like that. Mm. But we, you know, what I mean, I would say my badness started in about yeah thirteen years old, about year eight, year nine. You know, mm. what I'm trying to say by the time I was in year eight, year nine, and the man them that I grew up with on Wolf Road. We started, we went from playing football together to hanging around together to smoking yeah. weed together to selling weed together to that started to change. 
And then as we grew, the boys from Peckham were doing something similar. So then obviously I knew man from Woolworth Road, that's where I was from. But at the same time, spending five years in Peckham in secondary yeah. school meant that I was very much Peckham at the same time. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, just going into that um, and the kids that I grew up with, going from being a kids who were playing football in the block and then being told to stop playing football in the block. And you have to understand how long does a cute how long does a cute black kid stay cute before mm. his age means that now he's looked at systematically as a threat? Do you know what I mean? No, expand on I do get what you mean so by expand what I'm saying on that. So a bit more. You might see a black kid who's eight, nine years old or seven, and you think, oh, look at that cute kid. Mm. Now his mum's dressed him up in a football kid. Yeah. The neighbours don't mind him playing a bit of football. That same kid, five years later, now 13 years old, he's grown, he's about five foot seven, five foot eight, he's in a tracksuit, he's in a hoodie. The, the kicks on the wall are a bit a bit stronger now, they're a bit louder now. That neighbor's yeah. not looking at him as that cute yeah. kid no more. It's yeah. like, can you stop playing football here? Yeah. Like the, the the tone changes towards that child and how he's perceived through society changes. So mm-hmm. now that police officer sees that 13 year old who looks like he's 13 going on to 16, because you know how we're built different as you know, as black kids. Something's happened in the community. The first time he has an interaction with a police officer, he's 13 years old, he's been pulled over. Where are you coming from? What's happening? I'm only 13. What's your name? Boom, boom, boom. And he's like, what's that? Oh, sorry, wrong person. But it's that first initial. Did that, did that what happen are you to doing? You? Yeah, that's, that's that, that, that happened. happened that happened a lot. Not a lot, but it's something that Enough. was an early in- interaction with the police and it was, where are you going? What have you done? Type of thing. It wasn't like how it would have been five years prior to that mm-hmm. where the police officer might have been you know what I mean, being mm-hmm. nice to you or whatever it might be, it's now you're in that mode where you're fitting descriptions of in bracket suspects. You know what I'm trying to say? And looking back on that now, like at your age, can you put yourself in that place? What that actually, can you remember what that felt like when that first happened to you? No, I think, yeah, I think first time experiences are always ones that you look back at with um a different lens because when you're going through it it's always one of like what's this what does this mean sometimes i think you ask them those questions to yourself much later than at the present time time, when you're going through it but i think looking back at it it's just one of like what's this what's going on here because you're as baffled and as amused as the next person that's going through it but this is an experience that a load of kids you know, from your ethnicity that are going through around across the country, you know what I'm trying to say? So then that Comes experience, normal, right? yeah, that experience that you've had, you then come to share it. So you go into school, you're like, yeah, you know what, police, boom, oh, yeah, yeah, they done that to me before, yeah, yeah. So you think, oh, it's yeah, normal. Yeah, you like, think oh, it's normal happens, now because yeah. it's happened to my peers, right? Yeah. And then there might be a group of people who you play ball with and it's never happened to them. Some of your white bridges that you kick football with, they're like, right, is it? Why? What did you do? Yeah. Oh, I don't know, they just pulled it, is it? Like, then you just carry on talking, but it's just an experience that they've never had. Do you know what I'm trying to say? That continues into shaping um, this, this view of society that you have. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I'm trying to say? And then, like I said, it goes into seeing things that are different. So now you're in school, and you meet a man who's got an older brother who's out there trapping. And then through that, the younger brother gets to wear all the stuff the older brother's got. Mm. So he's coming to school wearing his brother's jean jacket, yeah, yeah. Versace, yeah. or he's wearing his brother's trainers that he shouldn't be wearing. And then you get introduced to designer kicks and all of this type of stuff. You're And you're thinking, wow, this is like, I need some of this. You know what I mean? And then the question goes, mom, yeah, you know, can you get me this? What mm. is it? You start. You don't even know the names. You just start saying, oh, I'll ask my you friend and you like come this, back. Yeah yeah, 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 you put pressure on your family. She can't afford it. It's pressure. How does your older brother get it? There's, there's three of you, right? There's, there's three. There's three so of you, four of you. She can't, yeah, they can't yeah. do that. It's a lot of money, you know what I mean? Yeah. We're talking about a hundred plus pound on a, on a pair of trainers that you so have to get for. That's for all of you. Yeah, that's yeah. for all of you. Yeah. Everyone wants it. That's 400 pound. Parent can't afford that. And then that's where that criminality, how do we get money? How are we able to... Uh, get money for ourselves to be able to buy these products and not have to go to our parents and ask them because we've done it once or twice. They've Mm -hmm. said, no, it's long now. How do we attain this without having? So you start skipping those routes of asking parents and and birthday money was never that big. And it's Mm -hmm. only once a year, even if it does come through. And you can't be waiting for those things once a year. So then you start forming new ideas of how to get paid, didn't it? 
was it quite was your would you say your household was quite strict would you say your mum was quite strict yeah yeah i was yeah. strict so i knew from from early on that certain things i couldn't do at home or i couldn't yeah. bring back to the house and yeah i just had to be on my on my a game in terms of bringing drama back to my house you know what i'm saying and the reason i'm asking that so i'm saying like even when you start first getting these things like you know like whatever you're doing you're doing you might get a little versace top mm. or whatnot i remember having to like literally I can't bring this stuff home though. No, no, no. Because my mum knows everything she gets to me. Yeah, yeah. So I like then and it can only work once or twice. We're like, oh no, that's so and so's top. Yeah, yeah. And then she'd it. look at me like, why are you pouring people's yeah, do you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, then yeah. I remember like literally I had a little pattern where that like, was in the house, but I'd throw it up in a carrier bag. Mm. Like and I'd hook it up there and I'd have to keep my clothes outside, the stuff yeah, that I was getting. But I'm saying yeah, so. Yeah, because so, yeah, hundred percent, because there's certain things you just couldn't bring home. Yeah. And you knew that or you'd have to park it off at your bedroom yeah, yard yeah, and yeah. make him bring it out. Because yeah. like I said again, certain people had a different level of leeway in their yeah, households. Yeah. But the right, not not to be like controversial, because I know you must know this as well. Did you notice a difference like in terms of African kids mm. and like the West Indian kids, like yeah, in yeah. terms of the Caribbean households, there yeah. was a lot of differences. And yeah. I was thinking that because I feel like we had the privilege, a lot of the African families, of being first and second generation. Mm. Whereas when we look at our Caribbean counterparts, a lot of them were like third and fourth generation. Yeah. Yeah. So the generation we're comparing ourselves to who wouldn't have done that had, had come and gone. Yeah, 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 you know yeah. what I mean? So now yeah. we're dealing with their children's children. Yeah, yeah. And now when you look at the African community today, it's no different to that. They're mm-hmm. running these things. We're seeing young African girls who are having kids and they'll make their kids smoke together. And that's because now we're seeing that we've caught up generationally. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You have to understand you were not allowed to come from the Caribbean to Britain if you had a criminal record. So you have to understand a group of people came from the Caribbean who were 100% professionals mm-hmm. without one criminal record. Those who had criminal records were not allowed to come. That was a part of the contract. So how does a group of people come here all qualified, all professionals, without one criminal record, who are nurses, doctors, and trades and carpets, whatever, then birth a generation of criminals. How mm-hmm. does that happen? You know what I'm saying? So you have to understand the nuances and, and the system that is set up, or that was set up, that allowed this to perpetrate and to continue. Yeah. You know I mean, they've come here thinking, cool, we've come here as doctors and oh, nurses and all of these things. Actually doing that within the... The, the, the system you're not yeah you're and on, on top that of role. that we didn't understand that our kids weren't going to be treated like they were children mm. of doctors and parents we didn't mm. understand that they were going to have these difficulties because sometimes you go into a space that's good for you but is it good for your kids yeah you know what i'm saying because you're a doctor and a nurse at work but what are they at school mm. what's their school environment for so you have to understand um the way we look at mental health now if you would have done an, an examination yeah. on the children of the windrush who are in this in the way they mentally went into that school mm. and how they mentally came out five, yeah. ten years later yeah. and seen the impact, you, we would have been surprised yeah. to see some of the results. 100%. Crazy, you know what I'm trying to say? So, I, I have these conversations, like even the other day when I look at, like you're talking about your story, your family, I was thinking, my mum came over here when she was 16. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? It's a child, like literally, mm. as a child, like she's a little Muslim girl from mm. Leone that's come over here. She didn't have, her parents stayed in Leone. Mm-hmm. So just that coming to somewhere that is completely alien from what Brave, she knew. And, and I think a lot of them went through that. Yeah. They came over at a very young age and it's that, like, like you're talking about mental health, I feel the impact and some of the things that we don't know. It's not the stories that we know. Yeah. It's the stories that we don't know. 100%. Do you know what I mean? And then like you're saying, how do you go from being 100% professional to basically having children that then go yeah. into criminality. Yeah, do you know course. what I mean? And yeah, that's what I'm yeah. saying. There's all those stories. And it's daunting. It's daunting at the best yeah. of times as a 16-year-old now to travel around the world yeah. with all the technology that keeps you connected with social yeah. media to your friends and family to then talk about how difficult it is now to do that in an era when that wasn't yeah. there, that support wasn't there. Yeah. So again, so having, growing up as we grew up and seeing that certain Caribbean families, you know, were a bit, you know, they, there was, a, I wouldn't call it leniency, but it was just a bit more, you know, things were going on in the household mm. that wasn't going on in, in yeah. African households. And I think it was very easy for us to be like, it's because they want it to be like that, or they're just, you know, they're a bit lackadaisical when it comes to mm. education or um, discipline, where that wasn't the case. They've just been beaten up longer. You know what I mean? When you're beaten up long enough, it's like when you see films or programs where a man's fresh in jail and he's all upbeat, like, yeah, I'm going to come out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my head down and I'm going to do well. And a man that's been in jail for ages, look at you think you think yeah, so. Yeah, yeah you yeah, think yeah, you're just yeah. gonna come and put your head down yeah, and get out. Right. Yeah. 
Go on, go in there with that attitude because yeah, 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 yeah. he knows we've been here. It's not that simple, bro. But you all came in there thinking, but the longer you get beaten down by a certain society and 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 the things that take place in that society, then mm. it gets to a point. It's like you're almost giving up. You know mm. what I mean? So yeah, yeah. So we found that a lot in Caribbean households, but being like I said, being at the level that I'm at now, I'm able to understand yeah. it more yeah. and understand the difficulties that that community went through and and continue to go through. And now we're all in it together to yeah. an extent. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I'm trying to say? But yeah, so yeah, having that growing up, knowing that we needed certain bits that we couldn't get, and that certain older brothers were already getting those things, and then learning from friends and their older brothers of how they're accumulating money and how they're getting mm. money and how they're buying these things from year nine year 10 you start getting into criminality um mm. selling drugs robbing doing whatever you gotta do to get yourself that latest product and then before you know it like i said the football team now becomes a gang because you guys used to play football in a football pitch yeah. and a pen and it's the same 15, 20 you kids I used to play. Quite a bit. Like, well, yeah, was, you quite, like, was you quite good? No, nah, no, nah, my thing good? is, that's all we had, innit? We like, didn't do I free shots. I think he was all that. Like, I nah, think he was all that. Was nah, you nah. quite good, yeah? That's all we done yeah. is play football. Yeah. So, obviously, growing up for us, it was like yeah. Athens yeah. Football Club yeah. in Peckham, right? And, like, um, we grew up in an area where that's what united us, innit? You become, you go from that age that age group where the neighbours are tolerating you to, like, now you man are too big to be out here. You know what I mean? And society's not really giving you those options like that. And they're telling you you're too big to be out here, but you're only like 13 or 14. It's not mm. like you're mad, but like mm. I said, we grow different. You know what I'm saying? So I think I went from that to rapping and then from rapping, forming OTB, the rap group. So what about like in terms of school? So like you finished at Postle? Yeah, I finished at Postle, done my GCSEs. But at the same time, I was on the streets and I was out yeah. there. But I've always, I've always had a bit about me that, you know, if I apply myself, the work got, got done. I mean, a lot of the stuff that I didn't do was based on me not applying myself just because it was more lit to be on the streets than it was to be in school. Mm-hmm. There was nothing lit about reading a book. I didn't find it exciting. Like, I found seeing what the men then were doing on the block exciting. You know what I'm saying? Like, when mm-hmm. I looked at that, I was like, right, I need to be outside. I don't need to be inside reading. Like, it was, there's nothing. Where does this take me? Because I see men outside and they're coming through in the BM, the Sadies, the they're coming through in something by being outside. I ain't see no one inside come mm. through with anything. Yeah. I don't see that. And yeah, from that, like I said, from the criminality to getting paid big money, you know, I think by the time I was 16, I was earning like a thousand pound a week. Mm. Um, you know what I mean? So and what's that from? Just moving bits? Moving bits. So being 17 and having, you know, and having 50 plus grand, 80, 19, and you're, you know, 60, 70 thousand pound up. Um, mm no one can really tell you much because you're driving mad cars you're tripped from top to bottom you've got jewelry on you're going to all the clubs you you got respect um so who like who in my family members who in my family household is going to tell me yeah when i'm on 4k a month that were you telling me to stop mm-hmm. or what is it you want me to stop for what and do what you know what i'm trying mm-hmm. to say but you're still at home these times these times I was like checking in at home, but living out home and away and on the roads and in the band, like we was out there in it. Mm. So it's like you come in, you check in, you're out. But as fast as the money came, as the fast as the money go, because we're buying a load of things, we're getting into turf wars, we're getting into beef, and you're losing money. So you're up 50, you lose 30, you got 20 left, you re up, you go again, then you're up, then you're, you're just up and downs, up and downs, you know what I'm trying to say? And I feel like. How would you see better that time when you place yourself at that time now? Mm. Mentally, how do you think you were feeling at the time? Mentally, I feel like... your mindset at that time? Man lived within the space of, am I even going to be alive at 25? You know what I'm saying? Who, 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 like, a couple of the men of mine have been dropped at 21, 22. Who, I don't even know anyone older than 25, but my uncles and that. But I don't know anyone in this life. Mm. The olders are 22, 23. You know what I mean? I'm 7, 18. Our olders are, like, like, the eldest, like, maybe 24. I don't mm. know no one that's 25 years old who is living like this. Man's in jail, a couple of man's been shot. So this is where we're going. So right now it's moments, isn't it? We're trying to see who's this guy that's going to live up to 30 years old, <laughs> getting paid Mental, money, you know what I'm saying? Think about yeah, that, yeah, like saying just living for the moment. Yeah, yeah. So we're living in moments, happiness, mm. raving, clubbing, getting money, girl, boom. It's just moments, moments. And then, yeah, the music industry, I think, started off 
where we said, let's try this music thing. I think Buck was the first person, went away, done some music with, with gigs and them lot on when they used to do the, the grind thing. Came back, they done like a rap record. And then when Buck started rapping, everyone thought, oh, Buck can rap. Okay, let's try mm. the thing, because this time they were listening to rock, the block, you know yeah. what I'm saying? So we've gone in the studio, we formed a rap group, OT. So we've gone from OT just being on the road to OT in the booth. And then Unit 10's formed. So that's when Spare No One's come to Unit 10. OTB's in Unit What's 10. Unit 10? Studio. Unit 10 was a studio on Wolf Road where everyone was there, like Big Lee Records, OTB, Spare No One. Um, Buck then moved to East London. Then he connected with people like Get Okay and that. So then Mandem used to come through. Mm. Um, we're doing a lot of mixtapes on like Bombsville. Um, they were traveling. They were getting an, in and around the country. So a lot of the time when Mandem were in prison, mm. they'll get the tapes sent in. And it was very an early stage, Channel U stuff. We dropped Closer yeah. on Channel U. That again, put us in a different space. See, I see, but you see while you're doing this, you're on the road all this time. Yeah, yeah while we're you're on doing the road, this. we're still trapping. Went to jail a couple of times. Yeah. Um, small, small incidences for like offensive weapon. I think done like half a year. Mm-hmm. Um, another one, failing to stop for police. Basically, I had something on me, so I just refused to stop. Mad police chase, threw it out the window, continued, got nicked. That was that. So done a couple spells in there, enough to know that. Cool, I've done the best part of a year and a bit in here. And this is not for me. So when you was in there, what was, what was your time like in there? What was like the full process at that time? Full process, the first time it was like, whatever. It is yeah. what it is. I'll be out in six months. I've got a year. The second time it was like, cool, it's nine months or something like that. Yeah, this is long, but it's whatever. But the second time is when I was also more spiritual, right? Yeah. So this time, yeah, I think we, were, we, had a, we had beef with man from Brixton. It was Peckham boys, Brixton. We was having our madnesses. We got madnesses in prison. But at the same time, before I went to prison, I was reading Call of Anne. Mm-hmm. Um, I was getting more spiritual. You could hear it in my rhymes when I was rapping. And then I had more time on my hands to sit down, read the Book of Allah. It was, it was, a, bit, it was a bit more spiritual for me that, that time in there. It was Ramadan, and I was able to embrace Islam. But also at the same time, knowing that where we was from in Peckham, we, we, Islam wasn't really a thing. Yeah. That mean, it was more of a Brixton thing. So knowing I got to come out and explain it to the man there and guy through this and they're thinking, right, you're on this phase and yeah, yeah, blah, yeah. blah, blah. So that was a thing. Came out, continued to rap. And then I think... Um, so like, for people that don't know, like obviously growing up in the area, mm-hmm. like you talk about Unit 10, like Spare No One, all of that. Like, Because I think a lot of the kids that are, under that generation would look back and say, oh, that's legendary. Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Ten, the people that used to go through there, the stuff that you lot were doing. At that time, did you know the stuff that you was doing was, well, yeah, to say that, because that's what they would probably look at. Like mm. all these young people you've got now that are like really big in music and that. Mm. I'm not saying it definitely you guys, but you're one of the, like, the you lot are yeah, the pioneers 100%. and set pace with that. Yeah, so yeah, hundred percent. Did you know? Did you know at the time that like, we're doing legendary things? No, I wouldn't know, but I think we knew that we were making different type of music that wasn't mm. made before. I think um, the UK was becoming very more culturally aware and not rapping in an American accent mm. or in an American style. We were, and it wasn't grime either. Yeah, like, it was yeah. real rap, and it was real flows coming from inner city kids. And I think it was changing that. And I feel like the new generation now that I talk to still have. Yeah, I feel like they they would be the older group now in rap, but I feel like yeah, they're still respectable coming across certain artists that I come across now who are prominent in the rap game who grew up on what we done. They still pay that level of homage. You say yeah, now mine grew up on your stuff, and yeah, yeah, you guys were the first to do what it is. I think like the only era of people who are still doing things like that is like gigs and ghetto and people who are, I would say yeah, who are from the older statements of of the music industry now. They're the ones that are still doing that. But they're still doing leg- legendary stuff. And like the conversations I have with people is always just happy to know that they've been able to excel and move families out of certain communities mm-hmm. and neighborhoods and do good for themselves and continuously open doors. Like Giggs is someone that I know continuously open doors. Like he does podcasts with people who got like 500 followers. And I'm like, how did you end up on that? And I was in a train. I was filling up my car, getting yeah. petrol. They came up to me and said, Rob, gigs, boom, boom, would you jump on a podcast? It's like, oh, yeah, right. No mm. problem. You know what I mean? So he's continuously 
sharing his platform with other people or he'll get on a track with someone who no one knows him. He said, why you do that? I like the beat. Mm. I jumped on. Do you know what I mean? Where sometimes people get to a certain stage and they don't want to support, they don't want to give back. He's someone like, he feels the vibe, feels the energy. He continuously helps, continuously reposts. Like I'll get young artists who are drawing and they're good at pictures. They might draw an image of H and then they, be, they might be like, Rod, you know, you know, Giz, can you get this picture to him? As soon as I get it to him, he posts it up, shouts them out. And he understands he's, um, the, the, the platform that he's created for himself. And he also remembers where we came from, right? And mm. be able to give that back. But a lot of the time, sometimes you don't get that from people. Mm. You know what I mean, but I feel like when you've come from what we've come from and you understand the struggle, how you understand it, then opportunity and giving people opportunity is massive. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And, and a lot of the time, um, people do that. And people from our era, especially in the people that I move, that we do that to our own detriment. Sometimes yeah. it comes back to bite you. Because from every person you help, one or two of them just going to be bad apples, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, cool. And it's just going to mess you up. But that doesn't stop the fact that we help and we continue to help and give back in different ways that, that we see for. So, yeah, yeah. So I think going from the streets to music um, was my journey. And I feel like I stopped doing music at, at a point where we, we had arrived in the streets and across the music scene, but we haven't arrived financially. You know what I'm trying to say? So I quit when like Talking the Hardest came out. I went to Egypt, started taking my religion you serious. Quit. So what was, yeah, go on. Could, yeah, yeah so when I became that. Muslim, I was just like, yeah. this is long. I can't do the rap thing and be Muslim at the same time. And I've never been a follower in terms of if I, if I want to do something, I, I like to do things properly. You know, I like to put my, my, my all into it. I like to understand, I like to immerse myself in what I'm trying to do. So when I rapped, I was always in the booth. And the only other person I found in the booth when I was there was Giggs. That's why I always knew that he was going to go to where he was going mm. to because he's someone also that Im immersed himself in the booth. Yeah, yeah, he had that work ethic. Yeah. So it's either I was in there, he was in there. So we've got loads of tracks that we've done. Some are, some are out, some are not out, but we were always in there. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Whereas some people were good at what they done, but they didn't have the work ethic. They had the talent, but they didn't. They didn't work hard at it. So seeing that, I said to myself, "Hold oh, on, I can't be a rap." We're, and we weren't solo artists. We were group artists. You know what I mean? We we're a part mm. of a a group. So I was thinking to myself, "I can't be around people who are not giving it what I'm giving it." Mm. I'm in here every day, and at the same time, as much as I love H and I love what he was doing, he was S and One. I'm OTB. We're we're together, but we're not. Yeah. Do you know what I'm trying to yeah. say? So. He's also got a camp of his own, like Kai's, Dread, Flipping, the rest of them. And it's like, he, like he's like he got to worry about that. I've got to worry about Buck, Swift, Ian, and all these men that are yeah. not really putting in the same level of work. So I was just like, this is long. I, I'm not going to be out here, in here every day, putting in the work, and I'm not getting the same getting the same um, level back from my team. You know what I'm trying to say? So, But I'm saying, how old was you at that age? That age, I was about 19. So you're 19, you're on the road, you're making money, you're, you're probably obviously getting some notoriety from mm -hmm. doing the music, right? Yeah, so yeah. people know who you are, they know who you are regardless, but mm -hmm. you're starting to get notoriety for that. You was in prison, so how do you, what's the mental, what's, what's the mental, what's going on in your mind to say, you know what, I'm 19, I'm going to Egypt? Like, I think I, the religious aspect is yeah. that Islam is a religion that is so obvious in when it's revealed to you and you understand, especially if you, if you come up for a Christian background. So most Christians, from my point of view, there's questions that you ask about Christianity that you don't think anyone else has the answer to it, but within Christianity itself, right? So then you find another way of life that is very similar to it, but answers a lot of your questions. Mm -hmm. And you think to yourself, how come no one told me this though? Or where, mm -hmm. where was this when I was answering these questions? So I feel like, um, what is what Islam does to you as an individual is it questions your whole existence and and and, and then it also questions what your parents have told you mm. and what they've been told. And then you start to see the systematic uh, approach that religion has been given as a whole mm. when really it's a way of life. I don't like the term religion, but really it's a way of life that if you believe in God or you believe in a higher power that has been ordained and you start to see how it connects with how we live life, you know what I mean? And it's, for me, it's having a manual to life, isn't it? Because one thing that we're given is that everything that 
has ever been created by us as men and women always comes with a manual. You could buy this mic and yeah. it will come with a manual. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get a it's chair, everything comes with instructions. Yeah, ingredients. And then you, yeah. Everything comes with instructions. You know what I mean? But then you get this complex being, human being, and there's no instructions. Now you're just here. But then I'm like, if we come with this idea that we're just here, why do we create things and never just leave it there and just like, that's just yeah, there? Yeah. Why do we give it instructions? Why do we create a chair and say, oh, the instructions is, is to pull it together yeah. like that. And the purpose of that chair yeah. is to sit on it. And that's where it is, isn't it? It's your purpose. It gives you purpose. Yeah, because a lot of the time people like to go on like, purpose is different. You ask someone, what's your purpose of life? Mm. To raise kids. That's not, that's not a purpose. That's an action of life. Mm. What's your purpose? Why are you here? Um, to make money. No, that's not a purpose. You know what I mean? That's an action that you take on in mm -hmm. life. Purpose of the shoes, no matter how they look or how they're created, is to protect a foot. Mm -hmm. Feet are, are, the, are, are what allow us to walk. Mm -hmm. If our feet are damaged, we can't yeah, get around. Yeah. We made shoes to protect mm -hmm. our feet. As time has gone on, we've changed designs and made them comfortable and made them look like this. And So as individuals, we might look different. We might talk different. We might walk different we might have different actions in our life but our purpose is connected yeah. it can't change yeah. your purpose can't be different to my purpose because we're one in the same in it we're one creation it's like a monkey is a monkey in it no matter if it's tall short yeah, yeah, it's yeah. a monkey in it that's yeah. it. it has its purpose in it, how it's what it does and how and what it's meant to do but as as human beings we try to disconnect ourselves and create instead of having a human race we have lots of races and da 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 and we like to think that we have different purposes. Mm -hmm. But once it's clear and it's been made clear to you that we all have one purpose, then the question is to ask, what is that purpose? Mm -hmm. And that's and that, what Islam gave you. And that's what Islam gave. Mm -hmm. So as human beings, no matter how many of us come after, we have the same purpose as that first person. And when that first person was here, there was no cars, no buildings, no, what was mm -hmm. his purpose? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, there was 100%. a simplicity to his purpose when he was surrounded by greenery and looking you know what i mean what well, whatever his purpose is that's our purpose mm -hmm. so then once everyone traces it back it's for you to do your own homework mm -hmm. but obviously i traced it back to worship in terms of how that person was put on the earth and boom 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 once i figured it out through my journey i had to act upon it you know what i mean once i found the manual and that's one of the things if you find a manual to life and you believe it to be the manual to life mm -hmm. Then for me, I'm a person, I act upon my beliefs, you know what I mean? Because there's some, there was a statement that I posted earlier is that if you don't act upon your beliefs, you'll start to believe the way you act. Mm. Meaning that if you don't act upon the things that you believe in, you know, like, so if you don't act upon the things that you know are right in life mm. and you start to become arrogant and ignorant of it, and you start to do you whatever you want to do long that. enough, you start to believe yeah. in it. Yeah. So you start yeah. to believe it's right that I don't share. Yeah. It's right that I don't have time for people because you know, you become arrogant and you don't want to share and I think it's all about me. You live that long enough, you start making excuses why yeah. you think that's right. Yeah. But when you started off that journey, you knew that was wrong. You knew it was yeah. about sharing. You knew it was about giving, but you tell yourself this thing so long enough and you start acting upon it before you know it, you start to say, yeah, no, nah, yeah. this is all right. I'm all right to, like, your money is all right to be mine. Mm. I'm all right to take your stuff. But you know what? When you was at the bottom coming up, you knew that was yeah. wrong. Yeah. So if you don't act upon these beliefs that you have, you start to believe in how you act. You know what I'm trying to say? Do you have a favorite quote, Bernard, from that? Do you have a favorite quote? Um, one of my favorites is five before five. Taking care of five things before five things come to you. Taking care of your life before your death. Taking care of your health before you, you're not healthy. Taking care of your wealth before you have no money. Taking care of your free time before you become occupied. You know, the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad says, peace be upon him, talked about five before five. And these five things for me are the essence of everything. Because when we go through it is that when you're young and you have free time, you don't have no kids and da 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 He says, hey, take care of that. Because there's going to come a time when you're occupied yeah. and the time you had to do everything. You don't have it now. These people mm. are taking up time yeah. in your life, your kids, your family, your business. And when you had it, you thought you were free. You wasn't free. And your good health, you know what I mean? When you have it and you're young, like I was telling a man the other day, 
we used to ride bikes for the best part of eight hours a day and we'd ride it with someone on the back. Back in, man, yeah, from yeah, wolf yeah. to this. But yeah. you never felt it. Up and down, yeah. You, you never felt it. All, yeah. So they said, take care of your youth before your old yeah. age. Yeah. Because when you were young and you just ride it up and down, you never felt the workout. Mm. You just thought it was normal. Now you get to a point, you just saw one look around, you're like, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. take care of that before it comes. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Take care of your money before it comes to a point where you don't have it. A lot of us, when we got it, with the wealth comes to the point where you don't even have half of what you had then. And you're like, boy, I wish I would have just said it. So that thing of taking care of five things before the other five, the opposite of it, come to you. And your life before your death. Mm. A lot of us were in primary school yesterday. And now you think, raw, I've got kids in that. And you're just getting old. And for me, I like to break down life in periods of 20. You know what I mean? So your first 20, I'm having this conversation, my son is 13. So your first 20 years of life, for me, I think is to get some level of ground, grounded, mm. know yourself. And I don't advise anyone to go to university in their first 20 years of their life. You know what I mean? I, I put that in the next 20 years. Why is that? And I say that because as a young person, getting to know yourself and understand yourself, you find that you can get into your second 20 years of your life, 20s to 40s. And I'll say that within the first 10 of that, 20s to 30s, you can get to 25 and say, what I've done in uni was long. That's not even what yeah. I want to do because yeah. you're finding yourself, right? Yeah. You're trying to get to yourself. So I would always advise to think about that step between your first 10 of, of your second 20. So between 20 to 30 years old, that journey that you take through maybe A-levels, take some time out, travel mm. the world, understand yourself, because you might get back from traveling at 21 and say, you know what, this is what I really want to do at yeah. uni. And you go going with a different, I feel like also when you go into that setting of education, when you find people who are older than you in university who know why they're there, they're very grounded you see and grounded yeah. and determined. Yeah, they come in with a different type of drive. And I feel like we just push them in too quick rather than for them to see the world, right? So then I feel like your, first, your second 20 between t between 20 to 30, you're very young. You know what I mean? Yeah. I feel like you look back now and you think, right, them man, they're old. And they're, yeah, you yeah. get to 25, you realise, yeah, you don't know nothing, yeah, bro. Yeah, of course. And it's, it's funny even when you're talking about education because I've done it all the way straight through. So mm -hmm. regardless of what I've done, I've always stayed in education. Mm -hmm. I remember like literally going to uni at 18 and not our thing from where we're from set up a bit different. Mm -hmm. I remember going uni, doing those three years, and then coming straight back. Mm. So it's just like, I was there, I learned certain things, but I just come straight back to the manor, mm. mm. where it's like some of my peers, they had things sorted out for them. Mm -hmm. They had like, oh, you're going into this job. You're mm -hmm. going to this country when you finish. Yeah, Whereas yeah. I'm like, straight back in Peckham. Yeah. And it's just like, I haven't really been anymore. away. And then yeah, it's just yeah. like, ask, oh, so what do I do now? Because when I traveled, I went to Egypt at 21, came yeah. back at about 23, 24. It's been about three or four years there. And it just blew my mind. You know what I mean? What was that the world like? is it's a massive place, the world, man. You go to Egypt, you spend your time in a different country, different way of life, learning that there's different ways to live life mm. and to and to apply your life. And I'm saying seeing how, for example, having a leak in your house and the carpet come I mean the plumber comes there to fix it and he's not in no rush, no nothing. He comes, he looks at it, goes outside, sparks a cigarette, comes back in, looks at it again. It's like, what's going on? You're going to do the job? And yeah, I said, yeah. wait, man, calm down. Like, I'm this just is looking. Egypt, right? Yeah, yeah I'll t take your like, slow pace of life. Yeah. Man will spend maybe two hours there to do something you could have done in 30 minutes. But it shows you to just stop rushing. Where are you going? Yeah. Now, what's all this rush, rush, rush? You know what I'm saying? Learning how to line up in a queue and not even make no noise about it. It's just standard. Where here, it's like, you're like, what's it's taking too long? Because we're in this microwave society. Everything just pops, ping, microwave. We want everything microwave. You know what I'm saying? We ain't got time to clean chickens, cook. Like even just slaughtering your own chicken from like going to the market, getting the chicken while it's alive, slaughtering the chicken, taking off the feathers and, and, and really cooking and going through the process. And what was that process like for you being out there? Like obviously... It was humbling. That yeah. was able to rip the whole street life off me all the gangs, the gang wars, the beefs, it was able to make, to realise I was nothing. Going to the desert and flying hawks and they fly off and come back and seeing how the Bedouins lived in the desert in hard terrain with the camels and seeing how people would travel from long distances on, on foot with their animals, ride their animals, walk with their animals, seeing that the love that they had for them, 
seeing that there was a different world where social media, all that crap, it doesn't exist. And there was a time of Blackberry BBs, whatever it was called at the time, but mm. it doesn't exist. Like all of this, like realizing that I watched Match of the Day religiously, then I went two seasons without watching football. Yeah. I used to just watch what's going on. Is Man United winning? Yeah, they're still on top. I couldn't miss Match yeah. of the Day before. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I've got to watch footy. What happened to the... Then you just go, it's like, it's not that important. You need to get away. You need to change your environment. You need to step away. I was fortunate enough to know that you know, a lot of brothers were traveling to Egypt and there was a, there was a nice tight-knit community over there that allowed us to live. I met Loon from Bad Boys over there who converted to Islam. I met a Napoleon from Outlaws who also recently converted and he was out there. So I got to meet a lot of people from um, different parts of the world who were and also on that journey. journey and they were like people that actually journey. went in music that and then it. went from music and transitioned to Islam. So That's it. You know obviously, you've you got the same, you're in and different parts of the world. Like yeah. Napoleon, someone we grew up to with the Outlaws yeah. Tupac. So seeing Napoleon here in his journey and the same with um, Loon. You know, with bad boys and 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 listening and hearing their journey and and understanding that they also had the same um, questions and desires yeah. of change that they wanted to have in yeah. their life, regardless if they were around. Especially with someone like Napoleon, man, it's like Tupac was like an it was an icon. You yeah, know what I mean yeah, to a lot course. of us growing up. So for to see someone who was a part of those hit records like Shoot 'Em Up, but is it Hit 'Em Up and yeah. and all those other records that they put together. And to know someone who was with him and who had normal stories to tell, mm. that was massive, you know what I mean? So I came across a lot of different people from America, from Canada, Australia, who came from similar backgrounds and were all on that journey of change and purpose. So then coming back to the UK, I came back. What would you, so going off from that, because I'm trying to like put myself in that place, what was it like for, so let's say your, your nearest and dearest, like your mum, mm. your, your siblings, and you're like, look, I'm gone, I'm going to Egypt. What was that? Was that I think it was a difficult time. Or? It was a yeah. difficult time because now I look back, I realise I was young, right? I was 20 yeah. years old. I thought I was grown. I made moves with certainty. I moved with purpose. Yeah. I didn't move like, yeah, mum, you know what? No, mum, I'm going to Egypt. I'm going to study. I'm going to live. I'm taking, I'm going on my own. I'm going to come back, get married and take my wife. I'm moving with purpose. Like, I'm not moving like, mum, mm, I think I want to do, I'm, it's none Are of that. Sure? Yeah, there was a lot of assurance in how I moved. And I think that gave, that also then brought some calm to the situation. And then... Have you always been like that? Yeah, I feel like, again, that's because dad died early, right? So I was a protector and then that built me and built my character. So that purpose is something you've always moved with yeah, purpose. Yeah, like moving with purpose. If you're going to do something, you're going to do it. Like Talking saying, with being purpose, in the studio. Moving with purpose, yeah. working towards a purpose and being very clear on what you're trying to achieve. I think that's a really good quality to have because I feel like even for myself sometimes my intention might be, okay, I want to make this mm. happen, but there's not that surety. There isn't that mm. purpose like, oh, I'm moving yeah. like this and this is how it's happening. And I think that can be quite an infectious thing. When you're like that and you're quite sure of what you're doing, yeah. it can affect and other dreaming, people. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Like I don't always get it, right? Yeah. There's a lot of times, but like if you have a hundred, mm. like that's what people say, like, People only see the one time you scored. They they missed the other yeah. hundred and something times yeah. you missed. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah, there's a lot of misses. But when when you score, it's like yeah, yeah you know yeah, what I'm saying. Yeah. And that's what the people see. But and also understanding that our families, where sometimes we can give this, um, this like uh, we can look through these rose glasses at our parents. Like you know what I mean? Like they're they're our parents. They're grown ups. They know they don't know everything. Yeah. You know what I mean, a lot of them, like you said, they've come out at a young age, they've learned certain things. So they're learning from us. My mum learned a load of things through my journey. Like, raw, okay, so you can move like that. Ah, oh, so that is possible. Oh, so mum's learning from me as well. You know what I'm saying? What was that like though? Because you said you grew up in a Christian household. What was that like in terms of you embracing Islam and whatnot? Was there quite resistance from like No, not family? to a point, because yeah. I feel like Uganda is very mixed. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you have Muslims and Christians living within the same household. So I, I start to realise that I've got cousins who are Muslim and mm. they've been Muslim for a long time. And this is why they used to pray or speak in a f funny language I never understood. Yes. And this is why they always used to wash because they had to pray. And before it was like, what are they doing? You know what I mean? But then you start to, things start to unveil to you slowly. But um, yeah, man, I think my journey away allowed me to grow very fast. So that's why like my son's 13, he's already decided he does videography and film and stuff like that. 
he does acting, he does modeling, he's a lot like he does a lot of Calvin Klein and different type of adverts. And his his work has allowed him to travel through Europe while being at school. So example, when he's got a shoot in, in Holland, they might he might go to school on Monday and then Monday afternoon we go City at London City Airport, they'll fly him out to Amsterdam, he'll shoot on Tuesday mm. and then we'll fly out Tuesday night. So like Tuesday morning he'll shoot. You know what I'm saying? So you get on a plane, you're in Amsterdam in an hour and a half, right? So he's finished school. So then we get to the hotel Monday night. The whole of Tuesday he shoots, we fly back Tuesday evening. He's back on school on Wednesday. So he's only had one day off school, right? So when he tells his friends like, yeah, I was in Amsterdam shooting for CK, they're like, whatever. He was only off one day because their off one day means like, whatever, you know, you had a little cold, you missed one day off. But then they're not understanding what how much can be done in that one day. Like you flew out, done a shoot, and you're back. How how is that possible? Then he'll show them on his phone. They'll be like, for real? Do you know what I'm saying? And they'll ask the teachers, yeah, yeah, he took a day off because he had to go and shoot. So that opens up the world to him because, again, when we turn up, for example, in Amsterdam or in Spain, they have cars waiting for him with his name on it, like Mercedes cars, yeah. like, and they'll pick him up and say, okay, cool. Then they'll drive him to the hotel, drive him to the set, look after him and that's something that I've, I've let his mum experience because she's like what's all this work that you're doing I'm saying that I only do it not because he has to do it because the minute like he's taken a, a, a year off he's only gone back recently with River Island and stuff but it's like whenever he wants to do it but I only done it to let him know the world is small but vast you know what I mean mm-hmm. so don't get caught up in this environment of education and school and stuff like that and thinking that's all that mm-hmm. you see around you because you know, the last calendar year or the last two calendar years, you've made a load of money from, you know, from your work and it's nearly half the salary of your teachers. And you've done that in the best part of two months if you add all the days together. Mm. And at the end of the day, these teachers are educating you so you can earn money and look after yourself and learn it in a way which is a proper manner. You know what I'm trying to say? But the end goal is to be educated, to get a job, to work, to provide. To, 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 you, you know what I'm trying to say? You mentioned education a couple of mm. times. What's your feeling on that? Particularly, well, let's talk about the UK, the education system in the UK. For me, it depends how you... I view education as a method of educating someone in any walk of field that allows them to earn a living for themselves. So it's not maths, English, science, and sitting behind a desk and da da It's not because we the mechanics don't sit behind the desk you know what i mean and we hold them to a vast or we hold them to a higher level within our society those that create the mercedes the bmws the whatever that put them together they educate themselves enough to understand how to put an engine together how to do a b c and d put this beautiful machine together and we buy it for a load of money and it allows them to cut through life you know what i'm saying and mm. be comfortable so for me, if you can give your child an education that has purpose in their being, then it's wonderful. There's a load of us who's been educated in certain fields and there's no work for them. And I mean, I feel yeah. like a lot of it's just conveyor belt. You just work for someone else and it doesn't teach entrepreneurship or being your own person and being from the, from the get-go. And you find a lot of people who are entrepreneurs and doing this, they skipped all that education stuff, mm. all that going through certain things. And they got straight into working and building experience and understanding how the whole thing actually works and making their way through. And then there are others who have gone down a different path and there's others who've had things handed to them. But for me, again, it's always, I I push more for ownership and entrepreneurship Mm. and being able to add value to what you do, add enough value to it that someone wants to pay you for it. You know what I'm saying? And do it well. So like my son said, he doesn't want to go uni. He just wants to do A-levels and then go and travel. You know what I'm saying? So I said, no problem, we can send you abroad once you've done like a levels gone two years i'll help you because he does videography just mm. travel the world and take and take images show the people the world through your eyes and how you see mm, it yeah. and, and i said add enough value to it that they'll pay you to do that for them then i'm trying to say and then but he might travel again do a year two years and say you know what i want to do uni i want to get the next level out yeah, of this yeah but that's because again of having that time to understand you know what i'm trying to say like, and just I, be supportive i get the sense like you like like you say about entrepreneurship is it something that's always been within you no but i've always thought like i think maybe i've looked at it from a different lens and it's just like leadership mm. i feel like i've always been leading for the forefront 
in different aspects of life. And again, I feel like it just comes from that protecting. I feel like I took that leadership on when dad passed away, even though I wasn't told to. Mm -hmm. And I feel like those characteristics that I've attained have allowed me to continue to do what I'm doing. And I feel like it's not for everyone. I feel like some people have got to understand there's some people who are good number twos. And without those number twos, they're not on trying to lead anything. They're not on trying to own yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah. But you see that no, number you're two, wrong, isn't it? Everyone's got they a role, yeah. are massive to success. Mm -hmm. And without them and without you also, you know, like valuing the, what they bring to the table, then you're in problems. And I feel like a lot of number ones will, uh, will, um, will have massive number twos. It's just that when you're, the difference is with the, the threes, twos and ones is that that you always have someone to look to. So as a number one, you just have to be prepared to know that there's no one else for you to look to. Whereas two, number three looks at number two and says, yo, what are we doing? Yeah. Two looks at one and says, yo, what are we doing? One looks around, there's no one there. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just you. Yeah. So it's, and then you have to give that energy and strength to, to two. And then two goes and says, three, yeah, one said we're moving like this. We're mm. good. Mm. But where does one get that? And I always say to people, you know, when we talk about, charging people's batteries i always say who charges the charger you know what i'm saying i say it's charges, easy to who charges yeah. the charger i say that yeah. people always charge the mobile phone that needs charging i said what happens to a charger when it breaks that, that comes down to self-care as well isn't yeah, it self-care because the charger when it breaks it gets replaced mm. people don't replace phones they replace charges mm. people will fix the phone get the new screen get the new this and then continuously charge it charge it to give it life but when that charger breaks, it starts putting and just throw it yeah, away, yeah, get a new yeah. charger. So you find people who are good at sucking energy, they will suck all your energy as a charger. And then if you break or you ain't got time for them, as much as you think, ah, oh, if I don't support him, he might go through a bad period. Listen, most people that we charge, just don't support them. You'll find them a week later getting charged by someone else. Mm -hmm. But they just jump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, 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 like, that's what they do. Yeah. They just suck people's energy. So they'll come to you. Yeah, bro, I'm going through a madness. You'll charge him up, charge him up nonstop. Yeah. And then the one minute you don't charge him, oh, bro, you weren't there yeah, for yeah, me. Yeah, da, 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 yeah, 100%. Leave him. 100%. Give him two weeks. You're going to see him getting that same energy from someone else. Because yeah. that's what they do. But you as a charger, like, who, who's gonna, who charges your batteries? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Who... Who's there for you? So that self care is important, and understanding that, and having that um, that know how to kind of take that time out for you. But I guess for me, it's again, it's that spiritual journey, right? Where mm. I charge my batteries five times a day. I take my time out. I get into the spiritual. I wash. I cleanse. And I feel like when you look at the ritual of prayer in Islam, it takes you away if you take time to understand what you're doing. You know what I mean? You take time out of this worldly life to go and wash your hands and prepare, you know, you wash your feet, you wash your hands, you wash your ears. And these are all aspects of things that could have led you to, a, like, if you've gone and done something wrong, you've walked there with your feet. Mm -hmm. If you've gone and picked up things or moved things that, or harmed someone, you've done it with your hands. If you've said something, mm -hmm. you wash your mouth, you've done it with your mouth. If you heard something, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So you're washing these parts and these parts of your body that also sometimes are used to do bad things, you know what I'm trying to say? And then you make time out, and before you get on that mat, you declare, Allahu Akbar, God, you're the greatest. You declare it, like, no matter who, what, so this is from the wealthiest person in the world to the poorest person in the world. You, you make the declar declaration that you are the greatest, and then you get into that, and you talk, and you have that conversation. Guidance, help me, straight path. Not the one that's, you know what I mean? You're having that conversation with your Lord, and you're praying and you're asking for it. So for me, that's my therapy. Because mm -hmm. if, I, if I take time to understand what I'm doing, and I don't only do that once, I do that five times a day. If you look at the prayer, something that cleanses you and that cleans yeah. you, they said, who's better? The one that has a bath once a day or the one that has a bath five times a day? Mm -hmm. And some people say, why don't you pray once a day? It's too much. I say, all right, mm -hmm. cool. We're talking about cleansiness and being clean. And if I said this man cleans himself once a day and that man washes himself five, five times, times a day, day. Yeah. who would you perceive to be the cleanest out of the two? Do you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. So for us, it's just a means of cleansing. And that's where I charge my battery. It's a spiritual. So having those characteristics to be the number one and to be there to support and to help people, I feel like finding faith as well, that's allowed me to, to understand that. What do you think the perception people have of you? But I want to ask it in two parts. Mm -hmm. So you, when you were 21, what do you think people thought about you at that age? Like, remember you said there's two stages. Yeah, yeah. And what people think about you now. So start with the first one. What 
you think people thought about you. I think like my characteristics haven't changed, right? I am who I am, how I treat people, how I dealt with people, how people are able to liaise with me and have uh, a relationship with me hasn't changed. I came from a good household, didn't it? I, I, mm. didn't, I didn't see my elders and not give them their respect. I didn't mm. see mums on the block and not help them with shopping. I never saw, you know what I mean? Mm. My morals and my ethics stayed the same all the way through. Mm. Um, due to certain circumstances, man lived a certain life, but who I am was it like, the streets didn't change me, nor, the, nor did um, living a different lifestyle. You know what I'm saying? I am who I am, but I think it brought out different aspects of me. So some of the great characteristics I had while I was on the road, Islam allowed me to fulfill them and to live them out. So even when I was on the road, I used to help and give man, but I would help and give man and give him man food or give him man money or help him man on the roads or, you know, supply him man with extra grub where that's me giving back. But in reality, um, it's been a, it's detrimental to their growth. Do you know what I'm trying to mm. say? But to me, I think I'm doing good. But Islam's like, no, nah, you can still do that, but do it like this. Tell me two things you like about yourself. Um, two characteristics that I know that I have. I have patience, but I've got no tolerance. You know what I'm saying? So the Explain two, that. That sounds like a contradiction in terms. No, because patience is to be patient with someone. Yeah and to have time. Tolerance is not to accept your BS of why you're not moving. Yeah. You know what I mean? I can be patient with you to change and to better your lifestyle, but I can't be tolerant to your excuses why you don't want to change. And I mean, because sometimes my patience will be detrimental to myself because I'm so patient to the fact that it's now affecting me. But the mm. fact that I've grown this level of not being able to tolerate nonsense, I think it's, I've liked it because it's taken me out of stages. So I can go into a business deal or a transaction with someone and be patient for the company or the business to grow. Mm -hmm. But as soon as I see that they're playing games, I won't tolerate it and I'll step away from it. Because yeah. I realize that there's only one shot at this, life. There's no replays, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I'm not gonna waste my time. Like, you know, I can waste money, but I can't waste time. And I always say to people, waste as much money as you wanna waste because money comes and goes. And some of us forget that because we've been in spaces where we're like, oh, I can't do this, I ain't got money to do. And then you've been in spaces where the money comes and you forget that that was you the other mm. day or the other year. Too. But I would say my patience and, and my level to emphasize, emphasize with people, not sympathize, but emphasize. Mm. I think my level to put myself in your shoes allows me to see things from different angles. So I can be pissed off at you I can understand where you're at in your journey and why you see things, how you see things. And I can be comfortable saying, you know what, if I was in your situation, I might make the same choice you've where just made there. Where do you think there. that comes from? I think that's come from, you know, I think it's something that I've always had. I've always, you know, that's why people that know me, they've always, like, if something was going in the studio, my mum said, oh, I ask his what he thinks. And then someone say, don't ask him, man, because he can see it from all the angles. He's just not going to give us what we want it. Yeah. Some people just want to hear straight, yeah. no, yes. I'm yeah. like, no, but if I get it and I get it, you know what I mean? So You know what that reminds me of? So early on when you were talking about the picture, mm. you said, what did you say? Like a spit personality, yeah. like a double. Mm. And I feel from talking to you, maybe the reason you can empathise mm. is because you've, walk, you've walked in different shoes and yeah, you've had yeah. different lives. Like, 100%. To, um, being on the road, from being responsible from your, for your family, yeah. feeling that responsibility, from going out to Egypt, changing your life, being mm. in prison. So when you've like lived different lives, different mm. parts, it's all part of the same journey. Yeah, yeah. You can understand and say, I can empathise. And I feel yeah, like yeah. when you're saying that, a lot of that probably comes from that. I just said, maybe a lot of people haven't, you know, been on different paths. Yeah. They haven't seen a lot of differences. They, they know what they know. So mm -hmm. they can't understand why a certain person lives how they live or why yeah. they move like that because they're thinking, why? It's, and yeah. that's why I'm like, nice. No, life's not like that. You have to overstand certain situations for you to get a better understanding of, of it as a, as a whole. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. One of the questions I like to ask. So given everything you're going through right now, the world's going through, pandemic, mm. all of that sort of stuff. If you could be an animal, mm. what animal would you be and why? Um, I would say horse. The fact that we're dealing with horses. Yeah, they're elegant animals, strong animals. They, the way they gallop, the way they, they lead sometimes with their chest, the way they, they jump, um, their flexibility, their strength. You know, we talk about horsepower when a car is fast yeah, and yeah. serious. You know what I mean? I think since becoming close to horses and, and being able to go on a horse ranch every week, 
and being close to them. I'll say a horse. And I just like their elegance, their strength. And also, and sometimes they don't make too much noise. Like when I'm around them, they're very quiet, but um, they move with elegance. I like them. And they're strong. Like I said, like when I'm, sometimes I've got like seven or eight of them and I'm trying to direct them in a certain way. And one of them would just barge me walking past on my shoulder and I just feel the strength. <laughs> like I look down like, you know that yeah, he's there. Like, like, right. It's just like, like, look like they've got strong upper body chest strength there. Like they'll just walk past. Yeah. But at the same time, when riding the horse, I, I'm just so intrigued in terms of how um, responsive they are to the commands of going left and going right and stopping. Because when I first got on it, because these are polo horses, they're used for the sport. And when I'm on it, and my friend's saying, no, listen, just pull it, it will listen. And I'm thinking, really? Yeah. Because I haven't been on one for a while, so then I'm galloping, and then I, when I pull it, it's like it's like I break on a handlebar yeah, or something, yeah. like it just stops. But you know what, like, because we're talking and like, you're talking about horses and the mm. viewers probably thinking, what are you talking about? What is it about horses? Yeah, because earlier I spoke about, yeah. you know, being able to dream and to continue to dream. So I've got a friend who's got an organisation in the Gambia. It's called The Spot Project. Uh, it's, a, it's an orphanage that started around four or five years ago. And now it's an orphanage that houses like 30 kids, state of the art complex. Um, has been able to, we've been able to raise money and build it. Um, a beautiful place to be. And I wanted to add on to that, add on to this um, growth that we've had in the Gambia, where he's from. And I didn't want to go into the same space again of creating some type of orphanage and looking after kids again. I know the importance of looking after animals that we have in Islam. And in terms of, and I know there's a difference between when human beings um, have a closeness to you or a sadness to you when you pass away or when you die. But if you've ever seen animals mourn for their owner or their the person that took care of them, it's a different type of love again. And I tell people, it's one thing for humans to cry for you, but to see that like, I've seen camels cry for their owners and things like that and dogs, and it's like, what type of love mm. and passion did you have towards that creation for it to have that closeness to you? You know what I mean? And I want that. I want to create that type of um, connection between myself and these animals. And to also give that to other people who might not have that. And I feel like a lot of, and as there's a lot of lessons to learn from looking after horses, looking after animals, mm. seeing the hard work that goes into it, being able to understand them. And I want kids to learn that. And I feel like living how we live, mm. we don't get that. We don't get the hard work. We don't, I feel like if I took a lot of these inner city kids out of the community, and took them to the horse ranch, they would be shot. As much as they're on this bad boy team, da, 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 mm. but I just threw them in, with five horses and said, go and deal with them. They mm. wouldn't know how to move because them horses start moving towards you. You'd be like, yeah, well, what's yeah, going yeah, 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 You know yeah. what I mean? So I think I want to give something back to the kids that's different, something that's more affordable. So yeah, I have this, this idea that I'm in a process of trying to make a reality of starting a horse orphanage in the Gambia. There's a lot of horses that are used for tourism to take tourists ac- uh, around the beaches. Mm. They're not in the best state. They're not looked after in the best condition. So I want to pl- create a refuge for them to look after them and to set a standard yeah. within the industry in the country so that people know that, yes, you can make money and can benefit from the horses, but also look after them, you yeah. know what I mean, and give them a good standard of life. And you will earn more money in the long, long term because they will last longer. They will be healthier, they'll be able to do more trips across the beach because of that better health that they have, you know mm-hmm. what I'm trying to say? So that's one thing I'm doing. So once a week, you know, I go up to the to the ranch here. It's a private one, so I don't want to give the location. Yeah. And yeah, I just learn how to look after the animals, the horses, and yeah, man, it's been an experience. So you were saying, so like, you journey back, so you get back to England. How do you get to what you're doing now? Yeah, so get back to England, continue to work in the community. We've done a lot of faith intervention work, going across universities, talking, um, going across a lot of youth programs and using faith as an intervention to crime, talking about how I was able to come off the streets, how I was able to change my life, what helped me do that, not saying it's for everyone, Mm -hmm. but just using faith as a tool to say, this is what helped me. It might be something different for you, but in using that as an aspect to help young people change their lives, um, and then, um, you know, like I said, my friend coming from the Gambia, going 
meeting someone who was out there doing some great work. He was like, you like have a big social media presence here doing your faith intervention work. Have you ever thought of coming back home and doing something in the Gambia? He was like, no, I never really thought about it. Went back. He went there because his family's from there. Then he mm -hmm. invited us over as a team a couple of years later. There was a plot of land, bought that land. And then from there, we just built up, built up. And like I said, now there's a massive state-of-the-art complex school, masjid, um, football pitch, like um, um, a small um, children's hospital, like massive. And it's all fresh mm -hmm. and top of the art to give the kids the best standard of living. Some of the kids have been thrown out to Egypt for a different standard of Arabic education. So then they can come back and teach the other kids. There's just a lot going on. And I think from my time there, I thought, okay, what can we do in the UK to connect yeah. back to the struggles we had growing up and the struggles that we had growing up that led us to selling certain things or like led us into the gang, the drug life. And for me, I thought to myself, why did we do what we done? Yeah. And I mean, what, what are the things that as soon as we got our first paycheck, what was the first thing that we spent our money on? You know what I'm saying? Because whatever we spent our money on is why we did what we did. Yeah, of course. And we weren't buying houses, we weren't buying cars, we were going into sports shops, buying tracksuits and trainers and living us and looking a certain way. And that allowed us to feel that we were we were the man. You know what I mean? And we didn't have that peer pressure of being bullied at school or people laughing at you because you're coming into school, you know what I mean, with a certain type of thing with that peer pressure. So then I thought I had a, and coming to the age that I was at now. Being able to afford stuff. A lot of value put on things, isn't yeah, yeah, it? Yeah, like, we put a lot of we value. value. Sometimes when you may maybe not have as much or have that setting where you own homes and your family own cars and these sort of things, like you don't come from that, you mm. hold value in these things. You're yeah, like, oh, yeah. yeah, I need these trainers. I need this track suit. It makes yeah, me feel, yeah. oh, I'm a man. Do you know what I mean? Or I've got this 100%. or I've got that. So well, you get stay to a, Yeah, you get to a certain age, you realise it doesn't mean much. Mm. And that's because you can afford that in, in abundance. So I just started distributing some of my shoes that I had to the homeless community in London. And then some of my friends said, oh, I see that you give out shoes to the homeless. I've got some kits on my house as well. I've got a load I've worn once or twice. They're just sitting there yeah. and come and get them. So we continue to do that. Then we distributed some to like some low income families. Then I just thought, you know what? I've done that for a year and a bit. And I think I've done it when the Grenfell fire took place. And I just started just before then. And I had about, I say 30, 40 pairs. And then they were talking about kids that were involved and they left their stuff. So I thought, let me just give all the trainers to them and some of the kits that I collected. Then I went quiet for a bit, continued to help my friend with his project in the Gambia and continued to do what I was doing here with my faith intervention work. Then I said to myself, you know what? But that was good. We had a mm -hmm. mad impact. And people are asking, what, do you still do the shoes? you still distribute? I've got some kids that need help. And I was like, nah. Then I said, okay. So I've gone to my friend and I'm like, you've got the charity, it's already established. Do you want to add the service onto what you're doing? Oh, we got a lot of work. We're building a school. We're doing everything. I can't take that on right now. Yeah. So then it forced me to say, okay, cool, let me do it. So then I said, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to need to create a social footprint so people know that what we're doing, is, you know what I mean? So I had to get my branding right because I said, I, I'm not in charities in it. That's not my thing. So I wanted to create like a social enterprise type of thing where it had to be a brand. I said to myself, if Nike or Adidas had a charity, how would it look like? Mm. You know what I'm saying? If they set themselves off to be a charity initially, how would that branding look like? How would a Nike charity look like? How would they brand it? How would they move forward? I didn't want to create a charity and a name where you wouldn't want to wear that T-shirt if you was outside of the charity work. Yeah. So yeah. you're out here raising money, you put the jumper on, and as soon as you finish, you take it off. I want something that transcends like Nike. You wouldn't take it off. If Nike created a charity hoodie tomorrow for some work that they were doing, you'd most probably wear it all day. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. of the brand power that they yeah. created behind it. So then putting over to... So looking at some words that connected to shoes and like making shoes whole again or reusing shoes. I came across Resole where you fix the sole of the shoe so you can get more use out of it. And then also I came across the word soul, which connects us to individual souls yeah. and knowing that every yeah. soul deserves a soul. So I was able to play on the word soul. So I went with Resoul and that was the birth, created the social media. And then we went on and then, yeah. So today we've distributed over, I would say. So what is Resoul? Resoul is the organization that I founded um, over two years ago. We distribute shoes to the homeless and most at risk youth in the country, unaccompanied minors, 
um, refugees, prison leavers, um, kids in school, um, young people in police custody. Um, we work in an in, in array of fields in the country um, supplying footwear to those that need it the most. Our bread and butter is supplying and supporting, you know, the homeless community and shelters that help the homeless community. Mm -hmm. So shelters are able to come to us and collect trainers for their service users. So we know we allow other um, institutions who are involved in helping the homeless community to come to us and maybe pick up 30 pairs of trainers that they can hold on to or they can use for the best part of two months before they can come back to us and get another pair and mm -hmm. we help loads of different ones. And then we go out ourselves on a monthly outreach to Manchester, Birmingham and London and distribute shoes. And then when we do that, we averagely, on an average, we distribute around 80 to 100 pairs at a time. And they're always fond of it because it fit, that's the only time they have that JD experience, that Foot yeah. Locker experience. Yeah, yeah. They turn up, yeah. there's a load of trainers on, on, on display. They, they're able to have choice. Whereas when you're homeless, you're just given, here, take some water, mm. take some sandwiches, take, take. Whereas they come here and we have it set up and they have choice. Like, what size are you? I'm a size six. Oh, we got 10 in size six. Yeah. Which one do you want? You know what I mean? Mm. They're able to have that choice and feel, you know, we humanize them again. And they feel, you know, they feel like it just makes a massive impact on, on, on themselves mentally. You know what I mean? Mm. And we always have those conversations. And like one guy said the other day, I feel, I feel real again. Yeah. You know, he had a new pair of 95s that we gave him. And, and he said, I feel real again. again. I feel real again. That yeah, was the best way he yeah. described it. I feel yeah. real again. You know what I mean? And that's powerful. important. You know, those things are, yeah, they are powerful and important for us to see the work that we do. And then the other bread and butter is supplying and footwear to the local kids in the Lambeth borough um, whose parents, you know, just can't afford footwear because they've got other bills to pay, especially in the climate that we've been in recently with COVID and people being cut back at jobs. A lot of kids are wearing their brother's shoes or their sister's shoes. It's either they're too big or too small, you know what I'm saying? And that has an impact on foot health, wearing shoes that are too big to you or too small, you know what I mean? So we're able to provide them with footwear. And with that, we've been able to channel in the big brands, Adidas, Nike, Puma. Um, they've all sat on the table with us and they all support us in various ways in any way they can do. And they realise the importance of being able to give back but again, for them, it's just important that they can support such a cause that also has a strong branding impact that we look like we're a part of the sneaker world. You come to resale, you might think you've walked into a, a boutique sneaker store, you yeah. know, that's selling yeah. high-end trainers yeah. because that's what we offer. But our branding was done purposely like that. So we, we, we become a part of the sneaker culture family rather than be on the outside, right? So that allows us to have that support and that allows us to be on that level with the brands that we can have those conversations and we can move together in making a difference. So yeah, so two years later now, we've been doing it for two years. We've distributed over half a million pounds worth of sneakers. Amazing. You know, we're on our way to 750,000. Um, and we think by the end of this year, we would have distributed a million pounds worth of sneakers. You know what I mean? And that's just by community support. So if we can do that with the community, there's, there's only so much more we can do with the support of bigger yeah. brands and us just pulling together and working together. Do you know what I mean? So what people can come in, like, so if I've got trainers, I can come in and bring the trainers to you. Yeah, yeah, you just pop, you just, you know, come down to our resale hub based in Brixton Village, drop them off, we clean them up, and then we categorise them, homeless, unaccompanied minors, young people, depending on, you know, the, the style of the shoe, and the condition of the shoe, we, we put them in different spaces. We also distribute shoes out in Africa, the Caribbean and South America. We work with single, single parents um, to allow them to create an income for themselves where they're able to sell some of the shoes and create a wage for themselves. Some of the barrels that we send over is, is the equivalent of like one year's living wage. Mm. So if a parent can then sell those shoes over the pace of space of like three to four months, they're able to earn what an average person in that country would earn in a year. Yeah. And then that allows them to then provide for herself, her children, you know what I mean? Yeah. And not to be out yeah. there begging or going through any type of difficulties. Because you were saying off camera earlier, what what's the wastage figures like? Yeah, so we're, we're, we're seeing about 300 million sneakers ending up in landfills every year. 
you know, and that's a massive amount. And we're looking at... A, what does that mean for someone that doesn't know, like... What do you mean it ends up in, so 300 million? Landfills, so they just ends up in landfills in Africa, Asia. A lot of the time our governments will pay these, will have these contracts with other governments that allows us to send our wastage to them. Um, a lot of the time some of these sneakers that end up in landfills, they're not actually even in bad condition. A lot of the time, sometimes we have wastage through misprint, mm. through colouring. They've been in the in the containers for too long, so white is now looking a bit beige and black is looking mm. a bit greyish and they're still spanking brand new trainers that can go to a group of people in society in the world who don't have shoes at all full stop mm. you know what i mean but for one reason or another you know sometimes brands don't put them out there they don't use them but we have had um good working relationships recently where um like a pair of trainers that puma had with um hundreds that they didn't want to release because of a misprint, they were able to distribute them to us and another organization in America called Have a Soul, and then we were able to give them out to kids. So they are trying their best, you know, the big brands added that's Nike and Puma to be more sustainable mm -hmm. and to, to move to a greener future of also changing the, the materials that they're using and being just more tech with it to, to kind of have a bigger impact on the planet. Because like I said, it takes up to the best part of 70 to 100 years for the midsole of any one of our trainers to decompose in the earth. And if we're having, like I said, 10 to 12, I can an average five to 10 pairs, we're mm -hmm. looking at five to a thousand years, yeah. 500 to five to a thousand years worth okay. of decomposing sneakers in our houses. So I think there's a lot for us to learn in our, as consumers and our shopping choices and our shopping experiences. Because if we choose not to buy these products, Mm -hmm. because they're not green enough or the materials are not sustainable enough then guess what the companies are going to do they're going to make them more green yeah, more, course, more sustainable they just follow what we say as consumers but for me is to ask the question to the consumer what happens to your shoes and your trainers when you don't want them no more when you go and throw them out put them in the green shoe in the bin do you know what happens to them a lot of the time we don't think we just throw stuff out mm -hmm. what happens to our rubbish where does it go like it just evaporates yeah, these are questions well, I don't even ask myself. We don't. Know. We just pull it in the bin, pull it out. Pull it in the bin, pull it out. What's happening to our rubbish? Where is it going? You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. So, Resol's all about sustainability. Third, second and third hand. Um, um, wow. Reuse. And just trying to balance off um, those that have and those that don't in our society. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I've got one more question for you. What advice would you give to the younger you? The younger me... Younger you and younger people, what advice would you give them? I said to listen more to your elders. I feel like one of the things is that we nothing is new under the sun. And I feel like a lot of the answers are held amongst the elders in our mm. community. But a lot of us, you know, we overlook the elders. Like, what do you know? Just because they're not sitting in a position that you might deem to be a position of power, you think, what does this man know? What is he like? Mm. Why, why should I listen to you? I'll tell any younger person is to, to listen more to Doris. I feel like we're in a generation now where we think we have the answers ourselves. We know more. We know this. We, we know that. But I feel like if you, like they say, you have two ears and one mouth. So it's an intent that you need to listen more than you speak. So it's just to listen. You know what I mean? Listen. Listen to what the people are saying. Listen to what's going on. Sometimes listening, keeping quiet long enough to listen, you hear some gems. You hear some things that's, you know, like one of the statements that I love is that um, the limbs of a person will always manifest what's in their heart. The you know limbs what I mean? of a person will always manifest what's in so their heart. Your actions will always come yeah. from what's inside. So no matter how long you hide it, sooner or later you're going to act upon what's in your heart. Mm -hmm. So you know a lot of people like to do crooked stuff and say well my heart is pure you're yeah, lying yeah, yeah, you're yeah, lying yeah yeah in my heart no 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 your whatever's in your heart you manifest yeah. it if you love to give charity in your heart it would show on your limbs mm -hmm. if you love to care for people it will show you you can't love to do something in your heart but never do, do it. it yeah it doesn't make sense you're just lying yeah. to us now and this is what a lot of people are like, don't judge me only god can judge me you don't know what's in my heart i know what's in your heart by your actions yeah. these actions come from what's in you know what I mean? These actions don't come from anything other than what's inside you. You know what I'm trying to say? So that's why I don't need to hear what people have to say. I can just look at power. someone's action and say, yeah, that person's a person that likes to give. 
based upon what? Their actions, right? Mm. So it's enough for me to know that. Um, and that's one of the sayings that I take um, dear to me, man, because we live in that time where people like to hide behind this. You don't know what's in my heart mm. <laughs> when it's written all yeah. over you, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, yeah. On that note, it's been an absolute pleasure. Myself. Pleasure myself. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum.